Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living Podcast at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum teacher, intuitive guide, and above all, an inquisitive soul. This podcast is about how we can bring the various spiritual, metaphysical, and esoteric concepts and ideas validated by quantum physics and modern cosmology to the very practical level to improve and enrich our life experience as individuals, communities, and the humankind. Whether you are listening to this show while driving or commuting, doing chores around the house, relaxing on a couch, or flying in a spaceship across the galaxy, I hope you'll enjoy today's episode. Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome back to Quantum Living. Most people, even of different cultural and religious backgrounds, are familiar with the concept that we are more than just a physical body and accept the notion of our spiritual self. This in itself implies the multidimensionality of our being, although we don't often use this term. We understand that the spirit or our soul has a higher frequency or vibration than our physical body. So that's already two dimensions, if we accept that the distinct different ranges of frequencies can be interpreted as dimensions. As we explore the various spiritual teachings, we learn about the human aura as well as other layers of increasingly more subtle and higher vibrational fields enveloping our physical body. These layers are the portals for the information exchange between our physical plane of existence and other planes or dimensions in the spiritual realm. While there are several different models and schools of thought on how many planes of existence are in the creation, ranging from 3 to 33, probably the most popular view is that there are seven and each of them has its own unique characteristics and energy vibration. These are the physical, astral, mental, causal, etheric, emotional, and spiritual planes. I suspect that each one contains several sub-layers with finely tuned frequencies and characteristics, bringing the total number to the multiples of seven, and actually, the mystical number 49, which is 7 times 7, comes to mind. Each of the key seven planes is linked to the corresponding chakra, from the root chakra to the crown chakra. So does our connection with all those dimensions beyond the physical make us multidimensional beings? Well, not per se, but the fact that we, our consciousness, our soul, exist in all of them simultaneously, is the defining aspect of our existence. As we evolve individually on our spiritual paths, we gain an understanding of, an insight into, and finally, a conscious access to those other dimensions, at which point we can fully appreciate and enjoy our existence as multidimensional beings. So what does it mean in practice? How can we benefit from this amazing state of being while on the physical plane? Life is information. The universe is information. Energy is information. And it is all about information exchange at the core. So we can access and use relevant information from those other planes. By opening up our sixth sense, our intuition, our psychic abilities, we can receive information through the veil. We can communicate with our loved ones who have crossed over. We can channel angels, our guides, Jesus Christ and other spiritual beings who can help us and guide us on our life journey. We can see into the past and the future, remote view, access the Akashic Records. We can heal our mind and body with various energy healing modalities, such as sound healing, acupuncture, and homeopathy. 
we can communicate with interdimensional beings. We can grow exponentially by expanding our conscious awareness to the frequencies beyond the physical, create our manifestations on the causal plane, heal the past traumas on the emotional plane, communicate telepathically with others through the mental plane, and so much more. I will talk more about all of this in my upcoming course. To take this concept even further into a deep rabbit hole, I can share with you my own spiritual insight, which is that each of those planes of existence is a hologram containing all other planes. This is made so that if one plane or dimension collapsed into a divine black hole, it would continue to function and could be accessed through any other plane. Effectively, the matrix of creation is indestructible. Think about that. And now I'd like to introduce to you my returning guest, Kedrick Olsen. Kedrick is an author, speaker, teacher, and paranormal expert with over 30 years of experience of guiding people through their supernatural and spiritual concerns. He's been featured in numerous TV and radio shows and documentaries. And you may have seen his interviews on Gaia, as I know that many of my listeners are also avid Gaia fans. His first appearance on my show was in season four, in a wonderful episode, Embracing the Paranormal. So if you have missed it by any chance, I recommend listening to it as well. You will find more information about Kedrick in his guest bio on my website, quantumlivingpodcast.com. Hello, Kedrick. Welcome to Quantum Living. It's lovely to have you back on my show. How are you? Hello, it's great to be here too. I am doing great. Thank you for having me on again. I'm excited to have another conversation with you. Oh, terrific. What's new with you since we spoke last time? Oh, I'm always developing and creating all sorts of stuff. I got lots of stuff in my head, just like cramming to get out. (laughs) So I'm putting together a whole series of classes on becoming a multidimensional self, which is going to lead into some deeper shadow working Uh kind of stuff. So I've got some big stuff that I'm working on. Oh, exciting. How exciting. And that's, in fact, what we'll be talking about today, about multidimensional self. Not long ago, I received your free ebook, Multidimensional Self, and I will ask you later on to tell us how people can access it. And I thought that this is the topic I would love to talk about on my show. So thank you again for accepting my invitation to come back and help me unpack this mysterious concept. As I said in my intro, this is one of those concepts that most people are aware of and accept in its simplest form, that we are much more than physical beings and have a much more important spiritual dimension. But I think it's important for us to understand to the extent we can the complexity of our true existence. And I really like the way you explain this layer by layer and show that we are not just two-dimensional or exist across two dimensions, but in fact, we are multidimensional beings. So let's talk about it, why it is important for us to understand it and how we can navigate and experience all those realities. You start your book with a concept of transcendence as a unique experience to the individual, which cannot be defined. But you also mention its qualities by which we can recognize it, such as synchronicity, psychic gifts, a sense of connectedness and information downloads from the spirit. Now, I must say that I'm a little bit worried about using this word as transcendence effectively means perfection to the point of superiority, as I understand it. And so one, it implies that until we start experiencing it, 
we are imperfect. And two, I know that many people feel that perfection is something they can never achieve, and so they won't even try. So before we get to your model of our multidimensionality, which you have so beautifully laid out, could you please speak to transcendence for a moment? Absolutely. And I definitely want to touch on that point about perfection, because I love that you're in sync with this, actually. You're already in sync, which is cool. Because in part two, the book, the free ebook is only part one. In part two, we go over what I call three assumptions. And the first assumption is you are perfect for who you need to be. And perfection is an ongoing process. So as you're working through this transcendence and you have this transcendent work where to transcend is, I like the word transcend because to me, it means to transit, to move beyond or to move to the other side of, mm-hmm. and it combines ascension to grow and to rise up. So we're basically leaving behind the enclosure, the, the trappings that lock us into a limited state of being. So we're transcending this limitation that is imposed upon us by the 3D world that we're living in here. And that's kind of what the point is with this work is to just be aware. Part one is just to be aware that you can be more and that you're perfect for who you need to be in that awareness. So I love that you brought up perfection because that's an important part of it. You don't have to achieve perfection. You are already. Yes. Thank, and thank you so much for explaining this. So I can't wait for the second part or part two. I don't know how many parts there will be because that was my first question in my mind when I read it. What about that? So does it mean that I'm imperfect? <laughs> so I feel that that part two will very nicely bridge those two different polarities of understanding of the word. And in the end of the day, this is really semantic. So an explanation of of the meaning will be very helpful. But yes, as I said, I I really love the way you have explained the whole concept, which we'll get to in a moment. Now, in your book, you also said one of the biggest secrets that we are never told about following a spiritual path is that spiritual growth is destructive. Is it destructive in a constructive way, if I can put it this way, and I hope that it is like the phoenix rising from its own ashes. That's a valid point, because it depends on your perspective. If you are going through your life that you have built for the past decades, that you thought this is how the world works, that this is who you are, that this is your place in the world, And now you're becoming spiritually attuned, you're becoming spiritually awakened, you're connecting to higher self, and everything you knew, everything you were comfortable with, suddenly comes crashing down and falling down around you. And uh, granted, I'm painting an extreme case here, but that has happened to a few people. But what usually ends up happening is the people in your life will start going, what is wrong with you? Why are you so weird? Why are you doing this? And you're feeling less attached to these people, less connected. And so that's what I mean by destructive is you're growing and becoming more aligned to your own authenticity. And in doing that, you might be moving away from all of the stuff that you built up around your life, the people, the situations, the things that that used to work for you, but aren't in alignment with who you are authentically. And so those things start to naturally fall away. And if you're still attached to that, let's say the egoic level, I I don't usually like to use that word, but if you're still attached to that way of life at the egoic level, it seems so destructive. It seems like, why am I even bothering? This is just falling apart. And people who have gone through a dark night of the soul where literally their world caves in and you know they get rock bottom, they're like, wow, I really wish I never started that path. But if they continue and they persist in their work, that space gets filled with things that are more in alignment with who they are, the people that will support them and reinforce who they are and who they're becoming. And it becomes basically kind of like a heaven on earth. It's just the only way to get to heaven is you got to go through hell sometimes. And so that's why spirituality can be a destructive process because you got to clear away the stuff that isn't working that you might be comfortable with before you can start adding in the stuff that is you and authentically you. Yes, and I am aware of that, and I have seen examples of that, and I've experienced myself that transition to an extent. So my question at this point is, given that this is the way it is, it's a fact of life, that that's the nature 
of spiritual growth. How can we facilitate it? Because as you said, many people would just say after experiencing the beginning of it, when things start falling apart and there's just too much discomfort and pain that they feel and they leave it, how could we bridge those two points of this transition, the beginning and the end, to make it, um, well, I'll use a physical term, more palatable <laughs> to for people because to an extent you need to have a level of courage. Could you please speak to this? Yep, you absolutely have to have that level of courage. And when I have clients coming on to my shadow program, I've got a six-week shadow working program, spiritually based. They've let me know right off the bat. It's like, ooh, I'm a little scared. I'm a little afraid of jumping into this. Well, you, you got to have that courage. You know, the only difference between fear and excitement is just a breath. They're the exact same energy. So feel that fear, feel that nervousness, feel that trepidation, own it, validate it, feel it for real and take a breath, breathe into it and then transmute it into this excitement and then take that step forward because we're all fearful. We're all afraid of that. But if you don't take that step forward, you're going to sit and stagnate. And that's the biggest problem about do not doing this work is you let that fear take over. You don't have that courage. And then you just sit and stew in all of those shadows and all of that negativity that locked you in. Meanwhile, higher self is saying, hey, wake up. Hey, let's get out of here. Hey, let's do this. And if you're too afraid, you don't have that courage to take that step and listen to higher self, it's just going to get worse and worse and worse until you one day just said, oh, crap, what, what the heck? What am I doing? So, yeah, take the courage leap. Do it. So does it effectively mean what, again, many people say is that sometimes you are or you may be not quite ready to move on to your spiritual path? And I feel that there is a reason why we tend to go or to open to our spiritual path much later in life. Okay, so when we are in our know, 50s, 60s and later, I think it's perhaps unusual to see younger people, you know, younger generation, because they are so preoccupied with the physical reality that probably the last thing on their mind would be, you know, how can I develop and reconnect with my spiritual self? So as we age and we gain more life experience and we, by nature, of our age and experience, we become less attached to our physical reality and even challenges. We tend to almost naturally open up to our spiritual pathway. Or maybe not. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> Is this your experience from your work with people? Absolutely. Absolutely. And the reason why I, I've come to understand this is I go back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And Maslow's hierarchy of needs, as some of you may know, is just basically like a pyramid. At the base of it, you've got to have your physical needs met, you know, your food, your water, your sustenance. You've got to have shelter. You've got to have a sense of security. You've got to have a place in society. You've got to have a social connection, social connection with people that you belong. Once you have the base of that pyramid set and founded, then you can move to the top of the pyramid, which most people don't talk about. And what's the top of that pyramid? Self-actualization. Once you're established with, you know you're going to get fed. You know that you've got a safe place to sleep. You know the people around you are going to be safe. Now you can suddenly go, oh, there's more to me than just this. What is it? Now, some people do have that when they're younger. You know, they're growing up and maybe life is a bit stable. Maybe they've got that. So some people in their 20s, you know, for whatever reason, they're connecting and maybe they don't need super solid stuff. You know, maybe they're happy with a paycheck and, you know, their apartment and that they've got some roommates and that's all they need. If they're feeling safe and secure where they are with what their situation is, then that higher self kicks on. That's that spiritual part of it kicks on and goes, mm. here you go. And for some of us, it takes us till we get later in life before we have that level of security. And that's okay. 
It doesn't matter. You know, they say that the best time to plant a tree is right was 10 years ago. <laughs> the next best time to plant a tree is right now. Yeah. So don't wait. Yeah. If you're feeling that pull, I don't care what age you are. If you're in your 20s, if you're in your 50s or 60s, I don't care. If you're feeling that pull, follow it and use it to wake up and enlighten yourself. Yes. And especially these days when the spiritual development and, and spiritual pathways are much more, if you like, acceptable and talked about topics in the mainstream, not just by you know, specific groups and, and secret societies, <laughs> but it is it actually becomes a norm and a trend even, which is what I like as long as it doesn't get commercialized in a way that would impede its purpose. Put it, let's put it this way. Lovely. Now, your model of our multidimensionality draws on various ancient spiritual traditions with one significant common denominator, that the creation has emerged out of nothingness and out of darkness, first as the divine light, which then span the spiritual realms and finally the physical world, in a way that each realm contains all the others, and today we just call it a hologram. And I love it. I love this model. It is simple and elegant. But then you introduce another realm you call etherality, if I pronounce it correctly, etherality, which sits between the physical and spiritual realms. So what is it and why do you separate it from the spiritual realm, which I think is perhaps a common view. So if you could please speak to this topic and give us maybe an overview of those realms and how did you arrive at having that eternality being separate from those main realms? This is one of the biggest challenges in working with this is our brain wants everything to be linear. Everything wants it, our brain wants everything to be quantized. Everything has to make sense. But all of these different layers, if we want to call them layers, are like spectrums. They're just overlapping spectrums of densities of energy. That's just, it's, we don't have the words yet to work, put that together. We're going to have to work on that over these next generations to find a better way to express it. And so when we are in 5D or spiritual reality, that is the realm of the afterlife where the spirits exist. And of course, we have corporeality here in the, on Earth. Now, there seems to be, over the years of my working with the paranormal, a distinction between, let's say, sovereign beings, sovereign spiritual beings, like humans and other type of ascended masters, th these kind of beings that are out there. There seems to be a difference in energy quality, a difference in energy level between that and I'm going to get in a little trouble here, but deities of certain religions, of angels, certain perceptions of angels and certain perceptions of demons and egregores and tulpas, which are created entities, servitors, thought forms. I'm looking at all of these entities and how they work and how they connect to humanity. And in all of these cases, in of all of the beings that are in this etheriality, this 4D, for whatever we want to call it, this fourth density, the spectrum of existence, they are reliant, they're dependent on humanity for their creation and their continued existence. They need our belief. They need our interaction. They need our devotion or worship of them for them to continue their existence. And so what I have seen is this ethereality, this 4D layer, is like a sandbox of human creation. Because human beings are powerfully creative. That's one of my rules of working with the paranormal, working with, with this transcendent work, is to recognize that human beings are powerful. One of the biggest ways we're powerful is we observe reality into creation. Anything you are observing, you are creating. There's actual science behind that. And Could you explain briefly? Yep. This is where we can start relying on some of the models that come out of quantum theory. Now, I have to say... How quantum physics works is not the same as spiritual metaphysics. It's not. The observer effect in quantum physics is completely different than the observer effect in metaphysics, but the metaphor applies. Meaning, if you observe something, you create it. 
just a little side note in quantum physics for you to observe a photon and the way a photon interacts, it has to interact with a, a receptor of some kind. It has to interact with a detector and that detector measures its energy. So that's the observer. And then we're observing the data of that. So it's not quite the same thing as us viewing a moment and something happening in the moment and that collapsing into reality, but the model works. And so if when we're creating something in 4D, it could start as simple as having a moment of fear. Like maybe there is a spirit in your house. Maybe it moves a book or something. And you have a moment of fear because you believe any sort of spiritual interaction has to be demonic because that's what churches told you. That's what people told you. That's what you saw in all the movies. Spiritual interaction is demonic. But meanwhile, a ball rolls across the floor, a book moves. <laughs> and you're like, oh, oh, it's a demon. You go to a fear state. You're now generating fear energy into the room around you. You're creating a thought form. That form, that thought form is going to poke you for fear energy because it's going to feed off of that fear energy. Now you're going to start creating a poltergeist effect, which is telekinetic ability. And you're reinforcing through observation and experience that there is a demon in the house. And you're going to tell stories about what this demon is. You're going to have stories. You're going to create more complexity to this demon. And now you're creating like a silver servitor or a tool type entity in your house that has a name, has a function, has a form, exactly as you defined it and described it. And in order for that entity to continue to exist, it has to interact with you. You have to be afraid. You have to tell its story. You have to perpetuate the belief of this entity so that it continues to exist. That's ethereality. Those are the entities that exist in the ether that that lie in between the corporeal and the spiritual reality. Now, there are potential, because we're talking spectrums here, there are potential for higher level 4D beings, especially Tulpa type entities, sometimes egregore type entities, to ascend into the 5D. They can grow themselves. They can develop their own sovereignty, and then they could become their own sovereign being, just like humans are. And they're no longer dependent on us for existence. But for the most part, I want you to think of the reality as a sandbox of energy where we are creating entities that we're interacting in. And again, if you don't know that, if you are not aware of the reality and how it works and how you create it and how you play in it, you could be victim to all sorts of nastiness going on in there, thinking that this is how things really are. And you're like succumb to it, but becoming a multidimensional being, you perceive that 4D, you perceive that 5D and you're going, oh, I just created a thought form. Okay. Poof. Let's make it go away. Oh, somebody else's egregore is now messing with me and interacting with me. Cool. Here's how I deal with that. And you shift your energies, you shift your consciousness in a way that those things can no longer affect you simply by being aware of how 4D works and how you can interact with it. Mm, very interesting. Thank you. And I really love your thinking behind it because it, it does make sense. Probably the most controversial aspect of it is that you include in this realm angels, while I would think that most people believe that angels are strictly in the higher spiritual realm. So if by your definition and in your model, if that reality contains energies created by us, by humans, then how did angels end up in there? <laughs> and also, what is the purpose of that particular realm? And that is definitely controversial. And I've definitely had people get mad at me when I suggest <laughs> that angels are actually egregores. Oh. Because what an egregore is is it's a collectively agreed upon entity. When we tell stories about what a being looks like, how a being acts, and they give that being a name, and we tell those stories over and over and over, and people truly believe that that entity exists, it exists, and they can interact with it, and it does exactly what they say it could do. And the reason why you can know that angels are egregores is because if you look at the angels of the Old Testament, 
they are not like the angels that you see at a New Age festival. They are completely different. The angels of the Old Testament are not these nice-looking humanoid figures with wings. Mm. You know, they got multiple eyes. They've got wheels within wheels and maybe some wings in there somewhere. <laughs> They're pretty frightening. And if you look at those original concepts of angels, they are scary as hell. They're destroying thousands of people. They're destroying cities. Like, just boom. They're very vengeful and destructive. But then you get to the New Age communities. You get to the modern times. And these angels are, you know, protectors, they're guardians, they're guides, they're very pretty and nice to look at. So we are reinventing and reinventing and reinventing these concepts of what angels are. And we do that with deities in pagan religions. It's the same kind of concept and the same kind of concept with demons. Because if we look to classic demonology and Catholicism, they're basically 72 demons that were originally gods in religions before Judaism. And those gods for those old, old, old religions were demonized by Judaism and Christianity and then turned into demons, which are now egregores that we all tell the stories about. So they're real in the sense that we can interact with them and that they interact and do what we say they do. But at the same time, they're human created. And that gives us a higher degree of control over them than we think we do. Well, that is really controversial. Yes. <laughs> I love bringing up controversial topics because <laughs> they make us think <laughs> and expand our horizons of, of possibilities. And, and that's what I like to bring up on my podcast. But that is heavy duty, <laughs> controversial, if, if you like Maybe not as controversial as some other point I will bring up in a moment. <laughs> <laughs> But just on the topic of uh, ethereality and aggregores and angels, if those entities, those energies in that particular realm are created by us, are thought forms, and I personally understand the, the concept, and I agree that, yes, we can do it and we do that. But then the question arises, If that's the case, and we're talking about angels, those very positive, benevolent beings that are protectors and help us, are our guides, etc. In doing so, are we actually creating those positive angels who exist in that realm next to those really bad guys? <laughs> yep, we are creating them and we are reinforcing their continued existence by interacting with them at the level that we say that they interact with. So we call upon uh, Archangel Michael to protect and clear the house of potential bad things. You fully believe it, it's there. Guess what? He's going to show up, he's going to do that work, and it's going to reinforce your belief in him because that happened. And so, yeah, we're interacting with him in the way that we say that he does. Interesting. Oh, I'm loving it. Thank you for bringing up this concept. May I ask, and probably we would need to go back to our earlier interview but because we, we talked more about it. What is the source of your insight about these topics? It's years. I was one of those kids that was communicating with spirits when I was in preschool. You know, I remember being on the playground talking with entities telling me about how layers of reality work, you know, talking about five worlds and how different things work. And it's been over the decades of interacting with them them showing me how this works, how that works, them taking me out of body and showing me different things. And then me having arguments with them. You know, I remember distinctly multiple times having these arguments great, going great. This is wonderful theory. These are great concepts, but it's basically nonsense if we can't apply it, if we can't use it. How do I put this to practical use? And I actually flat out just said, stop giving me stuff if we don't have a way of putting it to use. And so then they started showing me how to help people with this, how to guide people. Like if they're having a problem in the house, you know, paranormal problems in the house, how we go through that. And it really is an education. We don't have to, you know, sprinkle holy water and say by the power of Christ to kill things or move things out of the house. We shift their energies. We shift their understanding and their awareness. We do some inner work and then we change the energy inside. We change the energy outside. And my guides over the years have given me the theory, giving me the direct practical application, and then I've gone out and tested it and validated it multiple times with many people to say, great, here's what works, here's what works there. And at the same time, 
I don't know everything. I'm still learning all sorts of new stuff. I'll come across stuff sometimes. I'm just like, I have no idea what that is. Let's explore this and see it. So <laughs> there's just so much to learn. And I feel like I only know a tiny little fraction of it, even though you know I'm 51 years old and I've been doing this since I was a child. I only know a tiny little piece of what's going on out there. Great. So all this information came from your, let's call it spiritual insight and, and spiritual connection. Which realm are your guides from? Where do they reside? Do you know? Both. Ah. There are definitely some 4D entities that know this stuff and are willing to share and work with. And they're great to work with. You know, people who follow pagan traditions, I follow, you know, I follow the mm -hmm. Norse tradition. And I'm fully aware that some of these beings in there that we call Odin, Thor, Frere are egregores, but they're beneficial and wonderful to work with. And then there are other entities that I swear they're not even 5D, they're something else <laughs> that I, I don't quite know what they are, but no, I, I interact with the whole gamut of it. And I'll tell you what, even if I come across a low level 4D entity that's very manipulative and negative, I still learn from it. I still learn what it's about, what it does, how it interacts with people, you know, how it might interact with my client and it's messing with my client. And that teaches me a little bit more about our connection. So my guides are all over the place. Mm. And I think that the best discernment that we that anyone can have when when we come across this sort of information or spiritual insight coming from our intuition or from guides is how it resonates with us. So I feel that developing our sensitivity and our inner intuition is probably the best guidance because if we receive some information and we tune into it and we sit with it and it just doesn't feel right, doesn't resonate with us, probably this is not coming from a positive source. And conversely, if, if it resonates with us internally, like we can feel it in our bones, viscerally, as I call it, then most likely this is a legitimate, <laughs> let's call it this way, information. So could you speak to developing our own insight as a tool on the pathway of transcendence? Absolutely. One of my rules of this interaction and one of the rules of transcendence is test and validate everything everything because you need to develop that discernment and if you have a lower level entity that comes in and it says do this do this do this learn to trust your intuition does it feel right does it not feel right and if it doesn't feel right say no nope, i'm not working with you on this same thing a higher level entity comes in and says hey do this and you're like i don't think that feels right no i'm not going to do that you can push back here's the big difference a lower level, lower level entity will say, no, 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 do now, 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 now. If you don't do it, these bad things are going to happen to you. That bad thing's going to happen. You've got to do this. Here are the consequences. If you don't do what I tell you to do. And that'll make you feel like that sense of urgency. Like, oh my God, I got to do this before. A higher level entity will kind of nudge you, will poke you, give you kind of like an urge or kind of a nudge. Say, hey, go try this thing out. Go do this. You know, like it told me to buy a chair. And I'm like, no, it doesn't feel right. And they're just going to go, hmm, okay, that's fine. You've got forever. You know, they understand time at a completely different level than we do. Yeah. And they don't care if you get it right now or if you get it in 20 years. They're going to be like, cool, here you go. And if it's something that you really need to learn, they have this way of working with causal reality, which we I haven't quite mentioned there. They can mess with causal reality. And let's say they want you to learn something. And you're like, no, I don't want to learn that. I have enough going on. I'm not learning this stuff. And like, no, it's a really good idea for you to learn this. You know, you'll come across a website on it. You're like, no, delete. I don't want to see that. And then you'll have a friend come up to you and says, hey, I got this book out of nowhere. I thought you might use it. And it's on that subject. And that's how you know it's one of those guides nudging you. They're messing with causal reality for synchronicities to occur for you. So be aware of synchronicities. Lower level entities can't mess with causal reality. Higher level beings, they're not going to give you a consequence or an urgency they're just going to shrug their shoulders and go, hmm, okay, it's your free will. Go for it. Your choice, your life, but it's still a good idea if you do it. And eventually you'll learn to discern that. You'll pair that discernment of urgency versus non-urgency. You'll do that intuitive hit, and then you'll be able to go out into the real world. And that's the other important part is test it. Did they give you information that's valid? Can you make use of it? 
A lower level entity won't because they want to feed off of your fear, off of your negativity, off of your emotions. A higher level is going to give you that advice and you'll find it, you'll use it and you go, wow, that was cool. I didn't realize that. So that's how you build that discernment. Test and validate everything. Mm, beautiful. I'm very glad that you mentioned the causal reality or the causal plane, which is not in the first part of your book. And the reason I say this is that I have my own experiences with the causal plane in my spiritual work. So I know that that it is real. It is important. Are you going to talk about the causal plane in your further parts of the book? Not in part two or part three, but that will be an important part on another bit of work that I'm putting together. It's I've had a little precursor of it working now. I've got a, a, a Facebook group called Transcend the Shadow Matrix. Mm-hmm. And after this, part two and part three are out, which almost ready to go, almost ready to launch. I'm hoping soon we'll be ready to go. After that, I'll be working on this bigger eight-week course. And in that eight-week course, we're going to talk about the causal realm and how to work with causality from a shadow perspective. You know, because we're going to look at how things work and we're going to talk about why manifestation doesn't work, why the law of attraction falls apart, why it seems scattered. Like, you know, you try you try to conjure $100, you want to manifest $100, but you get $10. Well, why is that? And that's because of you're interacting with the causal realm, with a causal plane. And we need to do some shadow work to clear some of that crud out of there. So I've got a great shadow tool, a couple of great shadow tools that will get you to the deep, dark, ugly places of the psyche and the soul and how those parts are interacting with the causal plane so that you can clear those out and now have a much more effective time working with it. It's a bit more advanced working, but we'll get there. Lovely. And that's a, a very nice segue. I love segues. <laughs> As someone has pointed out to my next question, which is what is shadow matrix and what is its purpose? The shadow matrix is a term that I coined has nothing to do with the matrix movies, but some people think because I'm saying matrix, it has to do with the movies. What it really is, is just this big, vast network of shadows. And remember shadows are the things we think, feel, believe, and do that aren't really in our best interests, but we picked up these traits and these qualities because they did help us at one point. Well, everybody's got shadows and I mean, everybody has shadows everywhere. And we tend to project our shadows onto other people. That's how we know when a shadow is ready to work. If somebody pisses us off, somebody makes us angry, we're torqued off about the situation, for example. That's that's one of the ways. Or something happens and we just want to recluse and go, no, I don't want to do this. That's shadows. That's shadows being projected out into the world. Well, we project them onto each other collectively, like a matrix. And somebody is going awakened. They're connecting with spirituality. They're feeling something more. But the people around them are like going, you know, I think you've been drinking too much. You know, isn't cannabis legal where you are? No, you, you need to go back to work. You need just to know what you're doing. Now they're being pulled back down into the 3D world. So maybe they get a little hint. Maybe they go to a psychic fair because they feel the pull to that. And they talk to, talk to a psychic and the psychic gives them these insights. They're like, wow, this is great. I can do this. I can do that. And then they get to their job and they're talking to their co-workers and the job, the, the boss is like, look, if you aren't showing up doing your job, then you need to get back to your job or else you're out of here. So there's these consequences. And that's the shadow matrix is just these overlapping shadows that we project onto each other that keep us locked in to not being a multidimensional being, to keep us locked in, head down, just do your job, go back home, get ready for work the next, you know, do your job, go home, play video games or watch TV, get up the next morning, do your job, go, don't question it, don't do anything, but what you're told to do, that's what you're expected to do. That's the shadow matrix. Mm. Do we need shadows? Yes. Why? (laughs) Yeah, because shadows are fun. I love I love uh, Carolyn Elliott's model of shadow work. Like, imagine you're like this great cosmic being that doesn't know strife, that doesn't know any sort of upset or problems. Well, it gets bored. It wants to know what it's like to maybe struggle to achieve something. It wants to know what it's like to maybe go through something that's really difficult to go through. And so it comes into this world, into this earth to go, ooh, gosh, I want to be this spiritual person. I want to teach spirituality, but 
wouldn't it be fun and interesting if I grew up in a family that's just told me I was a crazy nutcase for doing that? Now, from ourselves and our egoic day-to-day selves, we're like, there's no way I would ever agree to doing that. But higher self is like, huh, that could be fun to have that kind of a challenge to grow through. Because if I learn how to grow out of a family that doesn't accept and love me for who I am spiritually, then maybe I can teach other people how to grow through that too. And then collectively, we can go through that. And so shadows are kind of the way that life is kept interesting. But One of the things I tell people, you may or may not be responsible for what happens to you, but you're 100% responsible for what you do with it. Accidents happen. You know, maybe we're born into a family and something happens and now it's super traumatic or super problematic and it was beyond what the soul expected or accidents literally happen. Accidents happen. So we build up these shadows and we can let those shadows bog us down and clog us up. Or we can learn to get through them. And then the third factor, this is the most important part about shadow work, is remember every one of the shadows you have helped you at one point in time. They weren't a shadow. They were a positive, beneficial personality trait. They were something that helped you for who you used to be when you were perfect. And perfection is ongoing. So when you work through your shadows and you get to a certain baseline of your spiritual growth, In five to 10 years, you're going to evolve spiritually. And the stuff that works for you now is going to be a shadow for you in five to 10 years. And you need to learn to work through those things because you're constantly evolving and those shadows are going to grow with you too. So yeah, we all have shadows and shadow work is constantly working, which is why I tell people you got to learn the skills because once you learn the shadow skills, they will last you beyond a lifetime. They'll carry them into the next lifetime and we're able to work through it so much easier. Yeah, lovely. In your book, you mention the realms of gods. Is there more than one god? And (laughs) I actually talked about it in my somewhat controversial episode with Gene Slater, Finding the Way to Myself, which was the final episode in season four, in which she said, of course, our god has their god, and there is a whole hierarchy of gods. And I actually agree with this point of view, as this is my own insight coming from the spirit too. And I love controversial topics, as I said. (laughs) So could you please speak to this from your perspective about the notion of multiple gods as opposed to just one god? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think it comes down to perceptions of the individual. We are on a wheel that has 8 billion or more spokes on it. And they're all leading to the same center of the wheel. And we create through our observation. Some people need one God, and that's totally cool. And for some people, that's universe, that's source, that not just, you know, Yahweh or Yadhevah. It's not just Jehovah. It maybe it's source. Maybe it's the universe, whatever they want to call it. That's fine. To me, the most powerfully creative thing in existence is the collective unconscious. That's sort of a God to me, but that's humanity altogether. However, we've created a whole choir of gods that are out there. Now, I know this is funny, but I want to show how this is kind of how this works, how these gods work and these egregores work. In Mm -hmm. uh, the TV series, American Gods, Neil Gaiman, there's an episode where they go to Easter's house, Ostara's house, the goddess of Easter. And she's having a party for all the other gods. Now, in this whole series, all the gods are egregores, all of them. They need humanity, and they know they need humanity. But when our main characters go to Easter's house, there's a bunch of different Jesuses. There's some that are walking on water. There's some that have stigmata. There are some that are healing. And the reason why they exist is because there's so many different churches that have so many different views of Jesus that they all created their own version of Jesus. And they're all real. They're all interacting. So yeah, there are millions of gods. There are potentially billions of gods because we're giving them our perception, our creation. And yes, they're real. 
And then we get into the divine realms, maybe sixth density, seventh density. And I honestly, this is my belief. I don't have proof of this. I don't have any way of quantifying or qualifying it. It's my belief that we do not have the capacity in our existence to quite understand what sixth and seventh density is like. We have a good idea of what fifth density could be, like the lower level of fifth density, the mid-level fifth density. But I think we start to lose our perception when we get to higher levels of fifth density. And I don't think we have any way of understanding sixth or seventh. I mean, we think we might, but I don't think we can just because it's so far out there. And that's where we would better be able to answer, or is there only one God or are there multiple gods? My answer is still, I, I, I don't know. Mm, thank you. And I really love your approach to this concept because it is from the point of view of us creating those gods entities and you are not talking about the role of the creator of all that is who then has their own god or creator at a larger scale and so it goes so basically it could be an unlimited number of of gods in the hierarchy of creation or of the creator so but your approach your take on it is i feel more acceptable <laughs> probably to to most people and it works and I like that there are nuances in the thinking you explain in your model. So thank you for sharing this. Now, another curious point you've made is about a place of non-existence. I think <laughs> that apart from multiple gods, <laughs> this is um, as far with twisting our brain as one can go <laughs> because we can't, we can't simply imagine, let alone comprehend, non-existence, quote-unquote. But I have a logical question about it, a logical inquiry, if you like. How do you reconcile the notion of non-existence with the widely accepted concept of gods, or in plural or singular, of gods' omnipresence or the Creator's omnipresence? Because if something is everywhere, by definition, there is no place where it is not. Exactly. So could you speak to this? Because the, I, I find it really curious. Obviously, you know, it goes well beyond our level of comprehension. But even at this logical level, how can we talk about omnipresence and a place of non-existence at the same time? Because to me, these are mutually exclusive. <laughs> yeah, that's a great, th great question. And that requires us to shift our model a little bit, mm -hmm. to shift our model. Because if we talk, talk about source energy, and it's just consciousness, this is the source energy, the nothingness, the, the darkness, because darkness is a substrate for all existence. Let's put it that way. It's the space between stars. Now, if we take this nothingness, this, this consciousness energy, and then condense it, that becomes the divine realms. You condense it, that becomes the spiritual realms. You condense it even further, that becomes electromagnetic light. You condense it even further, that electromagnetic magnetic light becomes solid matter. Well, another way to think of source energy is a field, a consciousness field. Now, when we go to field theory in physics, let's say the electromagnetic, electromagnetic field permeates everything. Electromagnetic magnetism is everywhere all the time, but it's at a zero energy state. There's no energy to it at all. And when there's a perturbation in this field, that's where we can have light. That's where we can have magnetism. And then when that perturbation energy zeroes out, it becomes nothing. You can't receive it. It's not there. But it's always there. What if consciousness is the same thing? That this source energy is just consciousness field. It's everything, everywhere, all at once, but it's at a zero energy state. And that everything that comes into existence, let's say even a rock, let's say a rock is a first level density of consciousness. It does have consciousness. It doesn't have awareness, but it has a degree of consciousness. Second, second density, like plants and certain animals have a second density of a consciousness, not necessarily awareness, but there's some awareness. But that consciousness permeates everything, making everything conscious. And where there is nothing in existence, 
which is not really possible in our physical universe because there's always something. Even in the vacuum of space, there's something. But where there is, say, nothing is just this zero state consciousness energy that is just waiting for something to perturb it into existence. For example, a brain. A brain is a great perturbation in the consciousness field that is super complex, it's super intricate, and can spin super complex, intricate weavings of consciousness energy. Therefore, we're aware. Therefore, we're conscious and we can raise to this higher state. So the brain is a 3D perturbation in the consciousness field, as is the soul. The soul is just, it is a coherent light. Let's say, call it coherent light, coherent energy. I'm sorry, self-coherent energy. It can hold itself together. But because it's self-coherent energy, it is also a perturbation of the consciousness field. It's just not as dense as the brain. So it's going to receive and process information intuitively, abstractly. It's not going to be so linear as the brain wants it because the brain is so dense. But it's all the same thing interacting with this consciousness field that is at a normal zero state until we perturb it. Mm, wow. Thank you. I really love your explanation. It's very, it's very elegant. Oh, I'm loving this. <laughs> Beautiful. So, coming back to the notion of us being multidimensional beings, can we access those other dimensions consciously? Because obviously we exist everywhere at the same time, but in terms of being aware of those other dimensions and our existence in those other dimensions. How can we do that? Or can we, short of having a, a spiritual experience or accessing our sixth sense, could you please speak to this for a moment? Yep. It is having spiritual experiences and accessing your clear abilities. That's one of the steps. When, when we have an interaction with a spiritual being, that's opening the door. It's what I call the believing seeing, seeing dynamic. If you can believe in it just a little bit, you'll see it. If you see it, you believe in it more. If you believe in it more, you see it even more. Now that you're seeing it more, you believe it until you know it. It's an actual thing. It's real. The supernatural is completely natural. And it starts that way, that whole back and forth. You know, we observe reality into creation. So you observe it. It proves itself to you. And then it creates the cyclical growth. Now you're starting to wonder, why am I hearing things? Why am I seeing things? Why do I smell roses when there's no roses around? Why am I picking these things up? Well, your clear senses are coming online. You need some training to help develop those abilities. Now I'm talking with entities, but they're answering my question before I can finish asking the question. And they're not answering me in words. I have the entire concept all at once. What's going on? Am I losing my mind? That's how you get there, is step by step being aware of those things, moving through the shadows that are locking you here, telling you that you're crazy, that you're having hallucinations, which we got to be careful. Some, sometimes people have biochemistry that's off and they are not having these experiences. They are having a problem with the brain. But, you know, we are developing and we're working through these things and we're working through that and we go, oh. And then you suddenly realize, like, oh, I've been this multi dimensional creature this entire time. It's just been shut off from me because of all these things. So, yeah, you just work through it step by step and you get there. Mm, beautiful. Thank you. How people can access your free ebook? Ah, if you go to kadrick.com slash multidimensional self. Okay. You can get it there. Or even just go to kadrick.com. There'll mm -hmm. be a link there, but you can get it directly. kadrick.com slash multidimensional self. Lovely. So, and I will include the link in the show notes, obviously. So once someone has downloaded the first part, will they automatically receive further parts or how does it work? Yeah, uh, the second and third part I'm working on, I've got videos for it. I got videos and I might have some PDFs, but I'll definitely have videos talking about it and some audio to help because it, there's more instructional stuff involved with this one, a little bit more detail. So it'll be an online course that you'll be able to download and go through the different courses. So part two and part three will all be bundled together, and then you can work through them at your own pace. Lovely. Thank you. Well, Kedrick, this has been a really um, super interesting conversation, and even 
after speaking with you on my earlier episode, when we talk about so many issues and topics, I still have learned something new and, and I just love those concepts that you developed in your models that not many people talk about or even think about. So thank you for your work and for sharing your, your work with us. Is there any final comment on the thoughts you would like to leave our audience with before we close? Yeah, is just allow yourself awareness. One of the things that I try to impress upon people is if you're seeing, feeling it, and experiencing it, it's valid. Okay, I did mention there's potential biochemistry that could be off, that could create something. But remember, even that, there's some validity to it. There's something. So be willing to experience something. Be willing to be aware of it and ask yourself, what, what is valid about this? Why am I experiencing this? What is this for? And that's one of the critical components. I have to say, that's how I can differentiate most of the time between somebody that's having a, 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 a neurological problem versus somebody having a spiritual problem. Is a person having a neurological problem? It's like, they're telling me these bad things. And of course it's happening to me because of this reason. And I'm like, okay, how about we try this? Oh no, that's not going to work. How about we try that? No, I know that's not going to work. Okay, I know that's a neurological problem because of course it's happening to them and they're telling them the bad things. This other person will say, well, I had this happen. It was really positive and I followed through on it and it was a really good thing and it's making me feel good. But why is this happening to me? What's going on? Is this real? Am I losing my mind? They're questioning it. They're wanting to go out and test and validate it. And that's how I know it's somebody having an actual spiritual experience. So whatever you're experiencing, let it be valid for some reason. Question it, test it, validate it, and that'll help you better understand what's going on with you and what you're experiencing. Lovely. Well, thank you so much, Kedrick. It's been a pleasure, as always, to have you on Quantum Living, and I can't wait for part two of your book. Thank you so much. You're so welcome, and thank you, too. I, I really appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you. That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes, guest and podcast info, reviews, comments, and much more, please visit quantumlivingpodcast.com. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then, keep your vibrations high and be well.